Okay, well, let's, let's start. Let me start by welcoming everybody. My name is uh, Wayne Dooling, and I'm here as the chair of the Center for African Studies. And my job is uh, purely ceremonial today um, to welcome all of you, to especially welcome our speaker, Ngozika Obiani, who is visiting us from the University of Nigeria. And I won't do introductions because my colleague Amelia will do that. Um, and I will, without any further ado, I will hand you over to Amelia, who will introduce our speaker and introduce uh, all of our panelists. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, I would also like to add my welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us. We still have people joining, which is good. Um, today, we're welcoming our Leventis scholar, who is in residence with us here in SOAS. And, and that is in the person of Dr. Ngozika Obi Ani. Dr. Ngozika Obi Ani is a lecturer at the University of Nigeria, Nsoka. And her research uh, covers questions or around surrounding IPOB and surrounding um, the Biafran state. And so, which is what she's going to be focusing on today. So uh, we would then have, we have two eminent professors who would discuss Ngozika's paper when she finishes. And we have Professor Mori last, who is more Nigerian than I am. He knows a lot about Nigeria. He's been in various parts of, uh, of the Nigerian state and very much understands the uh, Biafran war, the agitations. And so he's going to be our, uh, one of, um, our first discussant. And uh, I've put uh, in the chat uh, a little bit about uh, Professor Morey uh, last, a little bit about Professor Bobo, who is also uh, our second discussant. Professor Obobo is at the University of Ibadan. Uh, that's where he is. And so it's great. Uh, he's also a historian, uh, which is very important for our discussions today. So he would also uh, discuss, give us his views on Ngozika's uh, presentation and her paper. Um, we will then take, Ngozika is gracious enough to allow some question and uh, some questions. So we will take some questions. What I would suggest is we have, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q and A. Uh, please type in your questions in the Q and A. I'll pick those up and I would ask uh, Ngozika and uh, our two eminent professors, the panel to, to discuss those and provide some suggestions. Uh, I'm going to ask Ngozika, to, to, to speak and what she wants to discuss is she wants to look at a hypothetical position uh, of where we have the Biafran state. How would it function? She wants to help us unpack and understand where, how we got to where we are with IPOB, with MASOB and with the agitations in the Southeast. She's also going to touch on the impact of the, the insecurity, the impact of the current uh, uh, situation in the Southeast on citizens of the Southeast. Uh, and so it will be interesting, which is why we have uh, a huge number of registrations. So please engage with the chat. If you have comments, put them in the chat. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, box and I will pick up on, on those. Um, Ngozika has a presentation. So I'm going to ask Angelica to please uh, uh, put up uh, Ngozika's slides and Ngozika, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening, everyone, good morning. Good afternoon from wherever you are connected from. I'm uh, Ngozeka Obiani. I lecture at the Department of History and International Studies. I, my research is focused on conflict studies, gender, and then women. So today we are going to look at the 
hypothetical state of Biafra, some thoughts. This is a, is not a, I'm, I'm not a, I just want us to think about it. Anyone from the Southeast of Nigeria will know that uh, there are recent developments in Southeast Nigeria. So my thoughts, we've seen works on Biafra, civil war, memory studies on Biafra. And the idea now is that all of us, we want this state of Biafra because of what is happening in Southeast today. So my research, my paper is trying to say, how do we discuss, how do we remove emotion in this, uh, our quest for a separate existence from Nigeria? And then think deeper on if we should have this Biafra, what and what, what are the possibilities? What are the pros, what are the cons, what are the impossibilities of having this separate existence? Or like I ask, or will a restructured Nigeria, if Igbo will not be better off in a restructured uh, Nigeria? Angelica, please, you can now start sharing the slide. So anyone, the Nigeria Biafra was started in 1967 and ended in 1970. Prior to that, we had uh, tensile issues that uh, led to that war. We had the uh, election crisis, census crisis, TV uprising, and then the, the hallmark of it was the January 15 Q of 1966, where some Igbo army officers masterminded that Q. And in that Q, on the night of long knives, you find out that many uh, political and army officers from uh, the Northern and uh, the Western extractions were murdered. Only one Igbo lost his life. Shortly after the war, at the end of the day, the killings became well known. And again, some, some quarters mentioned that the attitude of some Igbo people domiciled in the North within that period, we are not there. Uh, they were so happy about what happened to the Saduan of Sokoto, who is a kind of a, theory, a theocratic and a political leader of the Northerners. So we there, and some of the internal grievances, more of economic that was prevalent in the Northern Nigeria within them, there was a kind of conspiracy on this massacre and civilians became a victim because of that uh, bottled up uh, but to the uh, grievances or nemesis concerning the Igbo, there was a kind of a window, and that window happened with that January 15 Q, and we saw a lot of Igbo people massacred. And up to today, no one can give account of how many people were killed in the northern Nigeria during that period, or how many people were buried in the in a mass grave nobody have been able to unearth the incidents of that period because after that event there was a kind of a silence there was a kind of official amnesia history was removed from the curriculum of uh, Nigeria in the sense that people, some people were not even aware of what happened. However, by July, by July 29, 1966, a revenge coup, what we call a revenge coup in history happened, where many, up to 182 army officers were murdered, excluding the civilians. Those who managed to escape came back to the East. People left the Northern Nigeria and the uh, we are back in the East. Because of the killings, the amputations, many atrocities committed, and some of them that were killed along the, the Benue Aziz, the people were enraged and they wanted a revenge. But that revenge wasn't well planned because the, 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 the people at the helm of affairs of Eastern Nigeria, we are, we are not able to look at, to weigh the the, the, the capability of Eastern Nigeria, of the uh, Eastern Nigeria then to wage that war. What happened was that we were we plunged into war that lasted for 30 months. And then the war came with its own, uh, its own issues in the sense that millions were killed, places were bombed, starvation became rife, many children lost their life, many young boys became children, child soldiers, and apart from, apart from that, women who were always at the receiving end, many were raped, many became impregnated, which is not the scope of this work. But today, after the end of the war in 1970, 
we had a long year of military rule in the sense that the military rule was there. We had queues and counter queues and counter queues until 1999 with the coming of Obasanjo into power after we had uh, a democratic elected government. Shortly after 1999, we had movement for the actualization of a uh, state of Biafra led by Rafu Wazirike. Oh, Obasanjo quickly arrested Rafu Wazirike and charged him for treason trial. That was it. We knew that there was something simmering like a, a splinter group called IPOB. This IPOB now came from, this IPOB was a splinter group from Masop. So they were led by Nam Dekan who formed the Radio Biafra in London. So this splinter group now became well known in 2015 when Nam Dekanu came back from uh, London and then Buhari, who is always visited with everything about uh, this Biafran war because of maybe his participation. What he did was that he, he quickly arrested Namde Kano. And then by then, Namde Kano had already uh, followers. He made him a kind of, uh, uh, he, he elevated Namde Kano and made him a kind of uh, a, a freedom fighter. And based on what was, is happening in the, in the country, the issues, you know, there is always a window when there is a kind of crisis, so structural imbalances, when you have economic issues, when you have insecurity issues, when things are not moving the way they should be. Because shortly after the war, there are certain policies that we are targeted against the Igbo. It is normal in history that the people that, that always write the history of any war are the victors. The, the, the victors are always the, the, the historians, is what they articulate, is what we have. Like Professor Mure last mentioned in one of his work, that some of them, when you try to stop these pe people from discussing, expressing their memory, what it means is that they move it out of the public domain and went into the private domain. That was exactly what happened after the Civil War. With this idea of not talking about it, not discussing about it, made people to take the, the, the memories of that war into their private public spaces. We knew so many of the policies brought out. Number one, shortly after the war, we had that uh, the banking uh, uh, system, we had the Igbos, we are giving 20 pounds. From my research in, during my PhD, some of them, money changers came and started giving people 80, 18 pounds. No matter the amount of money, the recovery was so much. Or the, uh, uh, do I talk about the, the military officers? Even those that participate, those that aided the Biafra course, all of them were, and the senior uh, public servants, they were all retired immediately after the war. Then other things we are put in place, quota system, uh, we have educationally disadvantaged, quota system, federal character, all these things, boundary adjustment, all of them were the policies, policies that the Nigeria government put in place in order to work to maintain structural imbalances. Okay, after the war, the war were defeated, and then the, the the older generation, which I will call the primary victims of that war, did what? They were docile, they accepted their fate, they lost the war. But today, the secondary victims, who are those people that did not experience the war, are no longer comfortable because the people could not understand where they will go for a federal competition, whether it's in the army, whether in the federal universities, and again, they will be etched out of the competition because of the particular place they, they are from. They will see people that scored uh, lower than them, but because of quota system, those people will do what will be get admi admitted. So that was why when Namdi Kanu came, this frustrated, unemployed Igbo youth saw him as a messiah. And that messiah, he had a string of followers. But the problem is that most of his solo followers also came from artisans, the army of unemployed youth who had little or no understanding of what is marginalization. And again, what they felt is like, they are just like the Jews that felt that living Egypt will be the best. So they saw Biafra as an El Dorado where they can, everything will be perfect. They are, will control their resources. But apart from that, the IPOB and their strategies sometimes don't go well with some enlightened people. For instance, 
the way you look at it, the sit at home order that has been arrived in the East. Look, the Inam de Kanu, each day he will go to court. It's become a national holiday from the East. East. Every Monday is declared a, 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 a sit at home order. If transporters, even school, schools, when they open, when, when they were being threatened, banks were being threatened, government workers, everybody will live in a kind of fear. We live in a kind of fear because of this order. Others encounter others. You can't just cut your nose. You, uh, you, you can't just cut your face to spite your nose to spite your face. In the sense that this is a kind of economic violence. I've witnessed not once, not twice, where, pe where people swear we are destroyed. To people's tomato, people that end daily were destroyed because of this. What is happening is becoming an economic violence on people that are living on their daily lives. And these people, because of lack of unified history of that period, like one of my informants told, told me that, okay, I don't have any history of the war unless the one that my father told me. How I wish I have a different version. What I would have known is to wait into and see what happens. I carried out a severe. Many younger people don't actually want the dialogue. But because when you ask them, how did you hear about the civil war? What they will tell you is this. That that I heard it through Twitter, I heard it through Facebook, I heard it, all these things are unverified outlets. Everybody is, saying, is talking the way anything, anybody can say anything about it. And again, they don't even have the idea of how things work in the international scene. For instance, they, would, uh, they don't know how UN will support them or the international community. All these things are the things that should be put into consideration, but none of them happen because we all, we are all frustrated. There is anger. There is hunger. And again, this thing, the government equally, the Buaris government, unleashed draconian strategy against IPOB. Number one, what he did was the unleashing of the oppression Python dance. He unleashed the state army against the, this uh, uh, ill-advised youth, massacred them on a daily basis. Today, what we see today is what? We, we see the, the, the ravaging of the Fulani uh, arms men. So the average Igbo man, a young person who did not experience the war, could not understand why would the AK-47 carrier Fulani has men will not will accord bandits? Why is it that Boko Haram are giving amnesty and that the, a very high cost being integrated into the society? But IPOB that are protesting, what do they call it? They proscribe IPOB. So all these things are the things agitating the minds of those that did not experience the war. We also understand them. We understand these grievances. But the problem is, how will this, if we engage it like this, we, and the war erupts, can we handle another war? Are we prepared for another war? Reading the history of war, unfortunate thing is that, it's quite unfortunate that I read the work of uh, Godwin Alabi Sama on the tragedy of victory. The preface, I was shocked at his preface. What did he say? He said that most of the writers of the Nigerian Civil War are not even telling us the truth. They were all proclaiming their gallantry. And he condemned most uh, vociferously the, the, the uh, Abbasanjo's uh, my command. I was like, wow. So if these people could not tell us the real story, how do we get the real story? How then is it, they, he mentioned that they are the people that caused the war and they will now allow the youth to fight the war and we lose that generation of the youth. So we don't have a unified history and there is a, a, an official sanction, official amnesia of that history of the war. And without that, like a Professor Kachi mentioned, without knowing that history, the, the mistake will keep repeating itself. So what I want us to this, look at is, this hypothetical state of Biafra, how will it work? Number one, let's look at the possibility. We look at the advantage we have. We have the geography. We, the abusive language the, the IPOB are using, I know why I'm using the IPOB as an example. We have other groups like Biafra Independent Movement, Biafra Zionist Movement and MASOP, but IPOB has been at the forefront of it. Uh, so the thing is that, What's the possibility to geography? If we use this abusive language, 
cursing every other person as zoo, as this, as that. Do we look at the geography? We look at the geography of uh, DC. You see that, you will now find out that uh, we need our neighbors. We need to, we can't live an island. We need to transact with them. So if we should go engage in war again, again, how then do we have this kind of diplomatic relations with our neighbors? That is the problem. We look at our geography. You, when I look at the map of Biafra as projected by this state, you saw them bringing in other groups, other minority group closer to us. Are they really, really interested? Are they really interested in this Biafran project? We also need to cultivate that kind of, uh, uh, cultivate them and then have, if we want to separate, we'll separate peacefully so that we can maintain that diplomatic relation. Okay, in, in landmass, we are small. But we can, if well managed, we can transform Igbo land. We have uh, uh, this human development index. If well managed, yeah, if we harnessed, harness, we can also develop Igbo land very well. But at least we need our neighbors in order to do this. If we should go for war again, what happened is that you will not be at peace with your, your people. Those people that are living outside Igbo land, majority of us are living outside Igbo land. Those people that are living in outside Igbo land, they will come back to Igbo land. When they come back, we will still have the same problem we had in 1966-67. In the sense that the, it will be a nightmare as that small landmass will not contain everybody. And again, their property could as well be declared abandoned too. And we are losing on every angle. So that is uh, the thing. We, if we maximize our landmass, we can link our waterways and everything. But the problem with Nigeria is because Nigeria is practicing what is called extractive uh, uh, political and economic system. The Biafra should think, we are, Biafra, is Biafra government going to give us a kind of inclusive political and economic system? Because when you, you, you project this inclusive political and economic system, what happens is that everybody will develop at their own pace. But extractive political uh, and economic system, which is being practiced today in Nigeria, is not making room for any pro progression. We are still stagnated. The problem that led to that war is still prevalent in Nigeria because we have refused to change. So that is another thing. We Biafra be practice that kind of thing. What of political instability? Are we going to be like the Somalians? Whereby the war, we will have warlords from different clans. Will an Anambra man allow the woman to spartend the, the, the Biafran nation? All these are the things we will, because first of all, we've not really projected a united front to the Nigeria uh, 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 nation. We, we, when, when we say, okay, to, we are now conversing for, for, for projection of uh, producing an Igbo president, are we coming together? You will see some people aligning with the others. We've not even had, been able to get uh, put our house in order, come together. Or are we going to be like Somalia shortly after the war? Every clan will have their warlords. But if Biafra should come, how will it, go in, will, how will it be administered? Are we going to find ourselves under IPOP dictatorship in the sense that they will, people are so scared to come out on Mondays because of probable fear? We are afraid. Business can be destroyed. People can, anything can happen to you if you venture outside on Monday. Is it what will, will happen? The only thing is a restructured Nigeria. Igbo people have been at the forefront of Pan Africanism. I think. If we sh the Nigerian government should be restructured, the best thing is that all of us, we will have an inclusive political and economic system in which every group, in which the government, what the government should do is what? The government should allow each, each state to develop according to their pace. But no, the, 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 the almighty or omnipotent federal government will not allow that because they, they are just like Father Christmas. They dole out, they will come to the state, take what belongs to the state, and then they will be doling out, it out to the, 
to the component units the way they like. We are all witnesses during Obasanjo's, re, uh, re, uh, Obasanjo's administration. He had issues with the Lagos state government. What did he do? He seized their, their, their allocation. This, despite, you know, some of our presidents, they don't even listen to, to, to uh, 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 cut injunctions. So what happened is that the, the states are, are the ones, are the crimes, at the mercy of the federal government. Another thing now, so what we need is that what they should do is that things should be done normal. Our forefathers, our nationalists that gave us the independence uh, uh, constitution, they specified all this is in the constitution, allowing each region to grow. I remember that during that period too, Michael Obara was able to get the, the Israeli marshals and they were able to give us the farm settlement we have in, the, in Eastern Nigeria and it worked because the regions were able to control what they have. The University of Nigeria wasn't built with Nigerian money. It was from revenue accruing from the Eastern government. People, the, each, each of them developed. But no, after that, what happened is that the, the coming of military into Nigeria, they destroyed everything. And those who are benefiting from this, uh, it, it, uh, 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 this imbalance, they don't want to do anything about it. And these are the windows, the gaps, they open for irredentist movement from all parts of the Nigeria. So let's look at it now. The, 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 they say that, the Zussi say that, that somebody without a guide, if you are fighting a war and you don't have a guide, it will lead you to the bush. Why is it that Nigerians and the Nigerian government, they are not interested in state police? We need a state police. How can a Fulani, Headers invade a particular community, and these governors will be living as the with this bogus title of uh, the chief security of their state. And yet, what happened? They can't even tell the commissioner of police in their state to act. The police commissioner will have to ring or guard in far away Abuja. We are lives who are being lost. When the, the Fulani attack in 2016, attack the Nimbo in Uzuwani. Our governor came around, I was crying like a baby because he was what? Incapacitated, he couldn't do anything. When it happened in, uh, in Benue State, our, our president was, uh, my, was, was bold enough to tell us that he commanded the IG of police to relocate to, and he never knew the man never took his order. He's the only person that wears the shoes that know where it pinches. In the sense that if we have a state police, it will come from the people from that state that knew the terrain very well. They can handle the issue of insecurity in their own, in their own states. But no, the almighty omnipotent federal government wants to control everything. They, why, are they, why are people afraid of state police? Number one, this army of youth will be employed. Nobody will be frustrated that the person cannot be enlisted in the Nigerian army or in, uh, in the military because, he's, uh, because of quota system. All of us will develop and remit whatever they can to the federal government. These are the things that should be considered. And when Nigeria moves, if Nigeria wants to stop this agitation, it, the only thing is to do the right thing. And that right thing is when you practice a, a, an inclusive political and economic system. All this issue will fizzle away. The, the issue of, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, marginalization, the issue of unemployment, the issue of insecurity, they will all, the steam will just naturally die. But never. Our government is rather not, is rather afraid to hear about secession. That was why money that should be used to develop infrastructure, give good road in the southeast, is being used to do what? In order to quell the hyper-based uh, secessionist movement, killing uh, 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 young boys. And again, what about the issue of this unknown gunman? What is it? What is it all about? There are so many conjectures conspiracies about this, uh, about this. Uh, and our governors, they look askance, the federal government, they don't even know what to do. And then they left that window open again 
and IPOB fill the gap by providing the Eastern security network. And the people want to be protected, to move around, and they need to be protected to, to, to carry out their daily business. So these are the windows that the federal government and the state government, they left wide. They left the security of the, of the they left the security of the people, the security of the lives of people and, and property of the people, and then allow non-state actors to take uh, charge. It is said that the, 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 the beatings of the war is easy, but the rhythms are very difficult to dance. Whether the, are you a protagonist or an antagonist, or, Antagonists of the of uh, Biafra agitation, you need war, war, war. Most of the people I interviewed, they want war, war, war. I was even surprised that people that experienced the war, war, to war, war, war. War is now sophisticated. Ask the ask the Ugandans, ask the Sierra Leones. I am afraid when a child of twelve years will be recruited as a child soldier. When you go to Sierra Leone, well, during the Sierra Leone uh, issue. Young boys are allowed, Ugandan issue, they will make you to kill one of your parents. They will make you to eat uh, somebody's flesh. What about the young girls? From nine years age, you will be raped. Who wants another war barely 50 years after the civil war? So my, 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 my discourse is, how do you think the possibilities are the possibilities of this hypothetical state of Biafra? We need to jettison uh, emotion and they think well. There are internal factors. From my research, I discovered the internal factor, factors that actually agitating the minds of the people. The economy is so bad. People are graduates and they can't find a job. One of my informants mentioned that the brother graduated and the person who is supposed to recruit him demanded one million for him to be given it. These are the people, things that people want a change. When the economy is good, people can feed, people can sleep with their two eyes closed. The irredentist movement like APOB will not have a, a, a follower. What we need is a restructured Nigeria. And I'm sure there is a restructured Nigeria will be a big field where Igbo can thrive. Uh, Abari, Senator Baribe mentioned, Namada What it means is that you don't go and bring war into your mother's kitchen. If you come with war into your mother's kitchen, so many things will be destroyed. Who is the loser? You are the loser. We, not, we need to remove emotion and think hard about this state of Biafra. And then reason that we don't need to bring what to our mother's kitchen again. Thank you for listening. Kosika, thank you so very much for that very powerful uh, discourse. And um, I can see that you're refreshing your, yourself because that was really, really uh, very powerfully uh, 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 stated and quite engaging. You've raised so many, so many issues. I'm going to turn to Professor Omari last to give us uh, his own thoughts uh, on the paper you have uh, written for us to read uh, in 10 minutes. Omari, please. I, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Well. Certainly, it was the Biafran War that actually made me leave northern Nigeria to retrain and become a medical anthropologist. So the Biafran War is close to my heart because I didn't, I have close friends on both sides. And so it's very nice to be able to hear what Dr. Ngoziga has to say. I have to admit, I had hoped that she would spell out or give us a map of the frontiers of this hypothetical Biafra, because the old Biafra had to invade, had to con 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 conquer its neighbors 
uh, and of course they didn't want to be under the Biafran world, the Calabar, Cross Rivers world, the Delta, even Port Harcourt and the Calabari there, or the Benin and Warris happily, they didn't actually want Igbo overrule in the old Biaf Biafra. So her point that the new Biafra would need neighbors is absolutely true and neighbors who might not always be very pleased to have an overpowering Biaf Biafra. So diplomacy would be crucial. But the reason why, of course, the old Biafra had to con conquer its neighbors militarily was that Biafra itself, Igbo land, has no oil and therefore no oil river. Revenues. Economically, it's a big problem. It also, by the way, had no salt. So it's difficult to cook as nicely as Igbo food is if you have no salt. So there is a very real sense that a new Biafra would need access to the sea as well as to an income stream as good as oil, even if in the new system, oil may be downplayed. But I think we can be sure that oil prices will remain fairly high. But my other big problem with the paper is the focus on what I would regard as tribalized Nigeria, where one speaks of Fulani or Igbo, uh, she didn't use the word Yoruba, and I'm glad she often referred to Southeast or East, 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 Easterners. But to be honest, if Nigeria is to work, one's got to downplay, in my view, the tribalization to become mixed and moved and to be able to move a round. So, her em 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 emphasis on Igbo as victims saddens me slightly because, of course, there are plenty of hungry, jobless people in northern Nigeria and in western Nigeria. It's not just a southeastern problem. The other point that worried me was her emphasis in calling, not just for the restructuring, which I can see is all part of the debate about states versus federal relationship, whether it's in the USA or Nigeria or anywhere else, even this land with its Scottish and, and uh, other nationalisms. But my worry is that she calls for a state police force, but she's never actually lived, it seems, under a world where there were state police forces. It was a radical reform to get rid of the state police forces to create a federal police force. If you do have a state police force in the 10 years that I lived in Nigeria with one, there was a basic politicization of that police force, of, of oppression, exploitation, and violence. It wasn't fun with the NA police. And I think, to be honest, Dr. Ngozga needs to look at the history of the police from the grassroots as a state form of political oppression. If you want to see it now, just look at the Hizba in Kano, which is actually a state police force. It's technically an illegal, an illegal legal one. It actually has a prison, which, which they aren't supposed to have, but they function. And with a lot of the Kanoa, they are a real, problem. So 
think more carefully about the history of state po po police and about their lack of accountability. The other point that I wanted to raise is this question of the diversity, which she mentioned, of factions wanting to create a new new than BF, Biafra. As she very wisely said, you need to have a single united focus to make any move movement work. But with so many diverse factions seeking recruits and usually cash, they don't want to you, you, um, unite. The same was true during the opposition in Western Nigeria to Abacha. They simply couldn't unite against him. And that is sad. Finally, I'd like to raise a more general question that her paper raises, though I don't think she raised it in her talk, is that there is what I regard as the old academics fallacy that basically only the most academically clever should have political power. And I think it raises the question, her paper points out how very few of the federal leaders had PhDs or even MAs or even BAs. But it does raise the question of who should have power? Does it go to the, the cleverest? As, as it happens, academics <laughs> tend to think it should. Or is it a more complicated the world? One of the great advantages of President Aziku, who handed me my PhD in person, and I shook his hand, was that he was an elder statesman as well. And what I think any new Biafra needs the old elder statesman to be wise and dip, diplomatic, leaving the, the pursuit of strength, power, whatever you like, to the young, but you need a central figure of authority. And Nandi Kanu doesn't really represent that in authority. He's lived abroad for such a lot of the time. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Engelsiger, for a very interesting and as the chairman said, passionate uh, talk. I think you, em you em emphasize the travails of Igbo land without actually realizing quite what the travails of Yoruba land, Hausa land, Kanore, all and Tiv and Edoma and Igala, all these other worlds. You aren't the only place that has problems. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Murray. Thank you for, for that um, candid uh, view. I'm just going to remind us of some of the key points uh, that Professor Murray had raised. He talked about um, the, the need for the a clarity of the frontiers of the new Biafra, and that is really important because linked to that point, is this whole idea of being landlocked. And he talked about access to the sea and income stream. Um, and Professor Murray was talking about a couple of decades ago before uh, oil was found in the Southeast. So right now we have uh, Southeastern states that are also designated as oil producing states in Nigeria. And somebody had put something in the chat uh, regarding uh, old, uh, old um, 
Biafran, uh, the, the geographical space. I, I think it's important to remind colleagues of what Dr. Obiani had said in her presentation, the need to uh, permit people to be who they are and not to enforce or, or, or force people to join uh, a grouping that they do not identify with. Uh, Professor Moray then talked about the need, the problem with, of tribe, of, of tribalized Nigeria, which, which we, we've seen and, and uh, that came strongly across in Professor Ani's, both the paper, Obiani's paper and her presentation. And then he, he picked up on the, the, the point, a point about state police. Uh, there's a lot more to be unpacked uh, on, on that uh, suggestion. And if we consider how Nigeria, Nigerian politicians, at least from what we read in the papers and what we hear in the news, uh, 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 um, the, the use they make of, of uh, the wrong use of uh, they make of power. Uh, that might be something, there might be something in there uh, for, for, for uh, Dr. Obiani to, to look at again. And uh, Professor Mori picked up on uh, the diversity, the internal diversity of the factions within the Biafran quote and unquote um, position or, 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 or state or communities. Uh, and of course, um, I, I, I had a smile on my face when Professor Mori was talking about the fallacy that only academics uh, can, uh, can hold or should have political power. Since I'm from Anambra State and we just finished our elections with, um, with the professor uh, becoming our, our, our governor in waiting. Um, I shall not say any more. I think we would uh, turn to Professor Ogogo of the history department of the University of Ibado to give us his own comments on Dr. Uh, Obiani's presentation and her paper. We've had the advantage of reading her paper. Professor Bobo, please. Thank you, Professor Nyema. Good evening, everyone. I like to say that the bulk of my reaction is based on her paper. And then a few other comments based on her presentation. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Ngozi Kubiani for giving us this chunk of ideas for us to brainstorm over. I'd like to start with the issue of conceptualization of Biafra. Um, I would have expected that she will interrogate how the advocates, the agitators of Biafra have conceptualized Biafra. Professor Last touched on it. Um, would you say that they conceive Biafra as the former Eastern region? Not what you think, what they are seeing, their own thoughts about it. Is it the former Eastern region? If it is not, because the former Eastern region includes what we now call the south-south part, the south-south region of Nigeria, if it does not include that, so is it limited to just Igbo land? If the answer is yes, then how do you conceptualize Igbo land? That is very critical moving forward. Secondly, I'm happy you made the point that historiography of the Nigerian Civil War is dominantly the story of the victorious. However, the narrative you have given of it seem to be that you two have agreed with that narrative. In the University of Ibadan here, we have done um, about four PAD theses on different aspects of the Nigerian Civil War. And the findings, are really shocking. If you even key into Father Kuka's uh, work on uh, power and, relig and religion in Northern Nigeria, he talks about the rejoicing in the North when the Sadwana was killed. It was much later 
that the narrative shifted and the issue of ethnicity became dominant. I would like to say that, um, yes, um, Professor Yema has also touched on the issue in her comments. I have noted it here for correction. Of course, there are parts of Igbo land where oil is produced in the Imo state area, the Oguta axis, um, and then even Obibu, even though it's a river state now, it's clear that the area produces oil and uh, by any stretch of definition can be categorized as part of Igbo land. Let me go to other issues. I expected when I saw your topic that you will derive your analysis from the views of Nande Kano and other officials of IPOB concerning how they want to govern. What are their views with regards to the state of Biafra that they are proposing? Yes, I did not know about Nande Kano until the present government came into power. But what I did was take some time, go to YouTube, try to find out what exactly is this young man saying. Because you can only critique the Biafra they are proposing when you have directly information about what they are proposing. How do they intend to govern? One of the things they put on the board is to say the bulk of the infelicities, the inadequacies of the Nigerian state will not be repeated in Biafra. So you want to take on those and see whether they are living what they are saying. How will the Biafran state of Nande Kanu's dreams, for instance, will differ from the Nigerian states? Again, clearly, IPOB is not calling for war. What they started with is a call for a referendum. There's an assumption by the Nigerian state, perhaps, that if that referendum takes place, it will ultimately result in Biafra pulling out. That may not be true but they have not called for war. In carrying arms much later in their engagement, it is more of a situation where um, they have almost been forced into that corner. You mentioned the ESN and the need to defend the defenseless women, children, and so on, as a result of the invasion of headsmen on their land. I would also have expected you to contextualize the, your discussion within the larger Nigerian framework. What do I mean? Um, the injustices. Yes, it may be more towards the Igbo, but there are a lot of other groups who are heavily discontented with the present Nigerian state. That's why you find the likes of Sunday Boho emerging. Even from some other minority groups, I'm aware that there's a Midwest movement. And their position is, look, if Biafra goes and Nigeria is getting dismembered, they also want to be together as a group. So it must not be assumed that if Biafra goes, what is now Nigeria will remain intact. So hypothetically speaking, other groups that may break away may also be willing to go into discussions, harmonious, friendly relations with Biafra. I am not supporting that Biafra should pull out but you are talking about a hypothetical situation. And so you need to interrogate all this. The cry for insurgency is across the country. 
Boko Haram, what is it about? It's insurgency. Sunday Boho in the Southwest, it's about insurgency. So it is not peculiar. That means the Nigerian state is sick and needs to urgently be attended to. And that is where I have issues with your paper because your paper is heavy on restructuring as a panacea to the crisis in Nigeria. Yes, but the managers of the state, you have not told us what should happen if and when they refuse to restructure. It's now take, don't forget that the good luck Jonathan administration called for a constitutional conference. That, that document that was produced was about restructuring. Now it is set aside. Injustices are taking place. People are calling for those injustices to be addressed. They are calling for restructuring. And the state is not engaging them at all. In that circumstance, what do you propose? Beyond the call for referendum, beyond secession, you are saying, yes, if Nigerian state goes the path of restructuring, but the Nigerian state is not doing that. So what should happen? And I think um, you will be in your paper, not presentation now, too lopsided about the unviability of a Biafran state. Let me play the devil's advocate. I am not for the dismemberment of Nigeria. However, supposing Nigeria says we don't want Biafra, Biafra be on your own. Are you telling me Biafra will not survive? In fact, I could argue that all the points you have raised the contrary is the case in terms of human, uh, manpower. The threat to their property. The bulk of Igbos today, yes, stay outside their homeland, but a substantial percentage stay outside Nigeria. If Biafra pulls out, who says that it will mean a return back to Igbo land? It may mean a further dispersal to other parts of the world. And they have excelled very well. In today's world, we are talking about human capital. What is the size of Japan as a country? And yet look at its economic capabilities. So all I'm saying is if you put on this scale, you can't just dismiss it with a wave of hand. Nigeria is better and the Igbos are better off in a united, just and progressive Nigeria. In in Nigeria, you have advocated should be properly restructured. But if that is not happening, then what will you advocate for? With the threat about properties, that has been ringing in the media for some time. And once IPOB issues come up, I partly grew up in Port Harcourt. I knew about the abandoned property issues. But it did not take the Igbos more than two and a half decades to bounce back as the most formidable group within the context of the economy of Nigeria. And so it is easy to say you want to appropriate someone's property. Can you manage it? If you can't produce it, you cannot manage it. I am not goading them on to break, but I am saying that because of that, should they then, just like the example you gave, the children of uh, Israel, oh, because they have properties in Egypt, they must not, they must remain in Egypt. There are two sides to the coin, that's the point. I'm making. For me, their strongest case is the unwillingness of the Nigerian state to reform. I mean, if you are holding me down and I'm saying release me and you are saying no, and yet you don't expect me to fight back, then something must be wrong with me. 
you properly said it, that the generation that fought the war, they are now in the minority in Igbo land. Children or young men and women of today are asking fundamental questions, which the Nigerian state is not able to respond to. And so long as you are not responding to it, you must expect a reaction. Again, with regards to the policies of Nigerian states that are antithetical to Igbo interests, I want to make the point that, yes, there may be one or two targeted at them after the war and so on, but the chunk of it, take the um, um, issue of quota and so on, it's not targeted at any particular group. It's just that if you belong to a group where a lot of people excel, you may then find yourself being disadvantaged. And so um, that impression needs to be corrected that they are basically anti Igbo policies. And with regards to the point uh, still on correction, history was not removed from the school curriculum in order to suppress information with regards to the Nigerian civil war. I can tell you as someone who has been in the saddle championing and championed the return of history, that the basic reason was the introduction of social studies and civics in the curriculum, the first nine years of the school curriculum. And then they tried to persuade historians, the education policy makers, history and geography will be part of social studies. When the curriculum was now drawn up, there was little or no history in that curriculum of social studies. So for 33 to 34 years, history was not taught at those levels. And that has produced the kind of young men now who are agitating and demanding for the breakup of the country. Not just in the South. What is the age of Sunday, Boho, for instance? Did you study any history? In the Middle Belt area, there are quite a number of voices showing discomfort and also interested in breaking away. The truth is, is this, Nigeria is better together. However, it must be a Nigeria that is just and fair to all. I thank you very much for the opportunity to express my views. Thank you so very, very much, uh, Professor Obobo. Thank you for, for those comments. So I'm just going to try and summarize uh, what for the, the core points that Professor Obobo raised. Uh, and he goes back to that idea of how Biafra is conceptualized, but this time from the perspective of the agitators for, uh, for uh, Biafra. And how do we construe the geographical limitations or, or, or mappings of, of Biafra? Because of course, then that will feed into some of the uh, this, uh, issues we've already raised. Uh, he talked about uh, us not, maybe we need clarity and understanding of Namde Kanu's vision uh, of how they will govern if they take over the reins of power. Uh, and can I just add there that uh, it shouldn't just be Namde Kanu, uh, their view. It must be the views yes. of all those who actually reside in, in, in Ibo land. It's, it's not enough for those of us who are not necessarily directly impacted by the actions taken in the Southeast to dictate and say, but it is for those as well who reside there, who are heavily impacted, whose livelihoods are impacted, who should also have a say on how that should be governed. And so it goes back to what Dr. Um, Obiani had mentioned about inclusivity. 
uh, about about en proper engagement and identifying what sort of state uh, the, the uh, Biafra should become. And, and then uh, Professor Bugu then talks about the core problem. And he talks about uh, the need for us to have a country that is united, just, and progressive. Ultimately, the, the sense that is coming through being that, well, if Nigeria as a state was functioning, I don't think anybody uh, uh, in this webinar would, would contest the fact that Nigeria is not functioning. If it was functioning as a state for the benefit of all its citizens, maybe the, the, the discourse might not arise. But clearly that seems appears to be the vision. It's how do we articulate that vision to be sure that it, it encompasses and includes uh, the points that uh, we, uh, our discussants have raised and Ngozi has also raised in her paper. So I'm now going to turn to Ngozi to, to respond, take another maximum 10 minutes uh, to respond because you do have loads of questions in the Q&A that um, I, I hope you've been looking at so that we can quickly head on to the Q&A. Please, can you respond to the discussants, their views? Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mure and Professor Bubu. Uh, I've taken note of uh, the issues raised in order to strengthen my paper. So, uh, uh, Professor Mure mentioned about maybe state police and the inherent problems. Uh, I understand that, but uh, we really need to start from somewhere. Because if we are not interested in state police, we won't, the, the Yorubas, the Southwestern, I won't come up with uh, maybe a Motekun and the Igbo, the Eastern Security Network, although the elites left that to the IPOB. And again, we model the American style. So America, they still have the state police. Maybe it did just start one day and they got it right today we ought to start somewhere because the way the, the police functions in Nigeria is, is it, that's the thing that led to the NSAS movement. Some of these issues that actually led to NSAS movement. I think we really need to start from somewhere to protect ourselves. People should find a way of protecting themselves. And then that may be, I may not have gotten it right, but that's may be the only solution now to some of these security problems we are having today. There is a way that things should be handled in order to secure the people. Instead of leaving the security of, of the people into the hands of the non-state actors, that is where it's creating more problem. Professor Bob, I took note of all you mentioned, uh, but... Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I discussed about the, the landmass and the human development uh, 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 index. And again, I had only issue with where you mentioned that how the abandoned property issue. Prof, I can confidently tell you as a student of the of Biafran question that many people actually lost their life as a result of that loss. Many could not recover. Many went back to the villages as a result of that. And you claim we bounced back in two, de decade, in, in two decades. Do we expect to rebuild again and then bounce back again? Because we have the capacity. It's not like that. We don't need to, 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 to build and then we, it's, we'll be taken away from us. My problem is that when you mention about the quota system, you find out that uh, when it comes, that uh, educational disadvantage, I know the cutoff mark of Enugu state, Anambra state, Imo state, you can't compare it with others. It's always very high. And this agitates the minds of the people. 
And when we discuss about the history, what I'm talking, my problem is not that the history issue is peculiar to the people of Igbo, of, uh, of uh, Igbo ethnic group, but the problem is that the history of the war should be known because if they had known what happened or what transpired, it could prevent a lot of things. By those, my, my research interest, my focus on Biafra has been on those that did not experience the war. That was why in my PhD, I tried to understand the people's experiences during that period. And that's why I went into the field to understand the perspectives of these people that were born. And you found that their problem is mainly on the economic issues and social and political issues in the country. It's more of contemporary. And when these are placed, put in place, in my survey, I had over 500 people that, uh, uh, that uh, responded to my survey. And most, the majority of people from 18 to 25, more than 90% of them said they want what? A dialogue. And then you are it's true that I agree with you when you mentioned about that the Nigerian state has placed the IPOB to the dark corner of struggling to defend themselves. But the, 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 the thing, whatever the, Niger the draconian measures that the Nigerian government adopted is back to the East, political assassinations, killings everywhere, the activities of the unknown government, the people, businesses are relocating out of the Eastern state. If you are living, it's all, if you are in East, maybe you understand the pain more than. That was why I'm trying to say, let's remove emotion. How will this state of Biafra work? I, I, that thing was uh, one of my, the editor, the person that looked at my paper initially, removed the aspect of where I mentioned about how they think this thing will work. They say they will have different parliaments. We are every dialect, every language can now, uh, they can now interact, uh, make, uh, do, um, they work with their language. And then maybe later they have a kind of one single language. But the only thing is that if you are do, you speak a do language. If you are this, Igbo will function with Igbo language. They just have a way. We are not talking about utopian. We are not talking about this kind of, you know, young people always want something that is this utopian, something that is uh, perfect, perfect. But there are things you need to consider. Maybe if go on and Ojuku, we are maybe in their 50s they may not have advocated for that civil war. They may have relaxed back. If, uh, uh, if um, uh, Nzogo and the rest, maybe we are in their fifties, they may look at things differently. And this is exactly the same thing we are. We want to look at it. I was born after the civil war, a decade after the civil war, but as a historian, I don't want a repeat of history. That's why I say we should remove emotion and think about it. Aside from that, I will look into, take a cognizance of uh, all your observations and incorporate them in my paper. Thank you, Professor Mure. Thank you, Professor Bobo. I'm really grateful. Thank you so very, very much for, for that, um, uh, for your response and for, for that uh, gracious uh, comment to look into the, the comments that our discussants have given. I'd want us to quickly move over to the questions. So the, 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 some questions basically repeat themselves. So what I, I'm going to start with um, the, the questions on restructuring. And if you can just tell us a little bit what you think, how you propose that the restructuring would move uh, this whole agitation forward so that the restructuring would effectively be a solution. And, you know, again, all, there are a number of questions on restructuring, but I think that would capture all the various questions on restructuring. Okay, what I mean by restructuring is that a, a, a place whereby there will be a kind of devolution of power in the sense that the, the, the power will not be concentrated at uh, the, 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 the central government. 
other states, constituent units should have that power to move at their own. When you devolve power, the, 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 the constituent units will now employ. There are certain things that the, the central government should not intervene. They can only manage the foreign policy, uh, or they can manage the uh, about the uh, production of a, of a currency. They can now, they, they are things that are in their exclusive legislative list, foreign policy, defense, immigration, custom, and the power to coin money. And the rest, others should be allowed to be with the, the, the state government. When you do that, every state will work hard to, in order to do what, to progress, in order to develop. When they do it, it's not dependent on them, whether they will leave their youth to roam about, there will be opportunities to employ people. What we need is that the federal government should not just come into a state, a constituent unit, and take the lion's share of what resources the people have in there, and then take it to Abuja. You come back and start dishing it out to them as for the Christmas, as I mentioned earlier. So what we need is what? Is where the power should be devolved. The central government should not have the ultimate power. Rather, power should be devolved to constituent units to allow them to develop. And when you allow them to develop that way, what you have in essence is what? Is an inclusive political and economic system, allowing everybody to develop at its own pace. And then these problems, this infrastructural uh, uh, development, all these things will put to rest. Okay, thank you. I want to pick up on another group of questions, and that is to do with the state police. And uh, I'm going to formulate this as a question, which is whether do you think that the state governors would hijack, using the word of the techno, um, come on, uh, whether the, st the state governors will hijack uh, state police for use for political uh, purposes? That I've, uh, I've uh, presented a paper somewhere, a lecture somewhere on the state police. And these are exactly the questions I encountered on that day. The state police is about fear. We are afraid. Before you go into state police, certain things should be in place. There are certain things that we are, it's because of the kind of uh, politics we play in our part of the world that people are afraid of this abuse. But if they are supposed to, uh, if they are supposed to put in place this state police, there will be structures, there will be uh, constitutions guiding uh, uh, this thing. These are, there are ways you put in place certain things that will now curtail abuse of power by the state uh, governors or by this thing. Okay, now that they don't even have, a, we don't use a state police, what happened? We have insecurity. The police are even poorly paid. Most of them are even, when you divide the police, you find out that major, half of them are busy protecting one big man in Abuja or one business uh, man, leaving the majority of the people with little police to handle them. So there are fears. I know that my, my, my what I know is that is not something that could easily be, uh, that can work immediately. But I think with time, and then if we are able to change our mindset on how we handle politics and, the, and the, the politics of money or stomach infrastructure, maybe with time we may get it uh, one way or the other. But us leaving the, 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 uh, the, the state governors it being incapacitated cannot act in the face of danger to protect the citizen is not also an, a, a good option. So this thing has not worked since uh, this thing. What nailed the idea of state police? Remember, during independence, the, the, the independence, the, the, it, the power was given to the regional government to have their own police, employ their own police. It's equally, even the, the Republican Constitution of 1963 did the same. But it is the 1999 Constitution that nailed the idea of each region having its police. In the said that they said that there's been no, we have only NPF, uh, Nigeria Police Force, 
that no other on other uh, unit can have that thing. And again, that was the problem we have. The governors are now the the chief security officer, but they can't even give order to the commission of police in their state. And most of all, the commissioners are not even members of the state. So when somebody is not your is not from your own area, how will the person respond when you are in danger? It takes someone with the a good heart to do that. If the person may not, the person may not act well. Okay, uh, I think uh, just to a, a quick uh, detour to to one of the points that Professor Moray made, and again, that's that question around tribalism and the whether Nigeria can ever become detribalized, and I think that's also coming through. One of, and that might be something that you may want to also take on board and properly look at uh, when you do redo the paper. And the second point uh, is on the state police and whether uh, this whole secessionist movements are actually an indication that the country is not ready for state police. And it might also be a security question for, for the, the, the Nigerian uh, uh, federal government. But those are things to consider. I want to move on to another group of questions around language and whether you know, the role that language can play, whether it's, going, it's as a help. You've already mentioned the fact that the way the IPOB conceptualizes their, their, their leadership would be for uh, people to operate in their different languages. And so we have a question here, whether that would be a help or a stumbling block for the development of the region. Can I ask you to give very short answers so I can take as many more questions as possible? What do you think on the, the language point? Uh, as a the, the language is not, when I saw that thing from the IPOB WhatsApp and then the map, I, I was like, I don't really know. We will end up having a common language in which we can interact. There are all the, our neighbors, we can't, I can't even hear their dialects. They may not even hear my own. So the thing there, the issue of language, I think uh, we will end up at the end of the day having a common language and that common language will be in English language because we can't interact in Igbo and we can't interact with uh, any other dialect that is in existence in the entire South, Southeastern Nigeria, former Southeastern Nigeria. Okay, so, so that then takes me, maybe I was anticipating that that would be your answer because the very first question we have queries whether Biafra is synonymous with Igbo. What do you think? For now, for now, those in Southeast, Biafra is synonymous with Igbo. Now, for those in Southeast. Because from my survey, over 500 people, I incorporated people from South South and not Central. Because of the how the IPOB have they've been projecting this so-called Biafra in the sense that the North Central are part, they are part of it, the South South are part of it. So one of the questionnaires I asked, are you a Biafra? And then people from that region said no. They are not Biafra. So for now, Biafra is synonymous with Igbo. Okay. Okay. So um uh, another question is um whether you think uh, that the strongest argument for why we need a Biafran state is that it will be the first African state that emerges through the will of the people. To answer this question, I think you should also engage with how do we know what the will of the people is? The will, of the for me, the... How we know that is the will of the people. Maybe from my own interaction, you can say that people is their will in the sense that, not all, in the sense that they, because of the hardship, frustration and anger, that is the thing leading. That was why I mentioned in my presentation that 
when you remove those things, you will see that the steam will just fizzle away. Fizzle away. Because one thing people fail to understand is this. When it comes to dialogue, the people that, that are in that meeting are the big men on suits. Not me and you. They will definitely exclude us in that dialogue. That was exactly what happened with the Sudan, Sudan issue. The men on suit did the dialogue. And what the ordinary people did was what the war continued from the bottom. That was why we are thinking that if this thing should come, let it come from the bottom, not from the men on suit again. We are tired of the men on suit. So the will of the people is based on the problems inherent in the Nigerian politics. Minus that thing, nobody will talk of secession. Okay, so um, the next set of questions is on gender, uh, because of course you work in that field as well. And so this is a question that asks whether you considered, whether you have considered the gendered aspect of the imagined Biafran state, what role and how women would thrive. I, I think for now, for the purposes of this question, let's disregard Nam Dekano's rhetorics and the Radio Biafra rhetorics, but how would, where would, how would the, the females fit within the imagined Biafra state? This is a really, a very interesting and question and uh, maybe a hard one at that. So the, the, the idea of women the only thing I'll tell you is that we are in a patriarchal system. Women, we are projecting, but not that we've gotten there. So I think that if the Biafra should emerge, it will not be different from other African states that practice uh, patriarchy. Women will still face certain marginalization somehow, somehow. So Biafra, even those projecting it, they've not said, okay, that women will be equal with men. Patriarchy will still rear its ugly head. Okay, let me push you a little bit uh, on, on this gender question because I am a very, very strong, uh, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a, you know, whichever put myself in a camp, but I'm a very, very strong believer in the equality of human beings whether you are, whether it's a question of uh, race, gender, whatever. Uh, I'm a firm believer in that. I want to push you a little bit on, on, on this question of gender. Where, how would you reimagine, what is it? If you're speaking for the women, Igbo women, the women you know, folk uh, that are Igbos, what, what do you think? What would you want to see within the reimagined Biafran state? What I want to see is simple. I want them to remove some cultural practices that have subordinated women from the beginning. All the cultural practices that are against women in every locality, in every community. Those practices, whether they claim it's from their ancestors or whether they claim they got it from somewhere, once they know what to do in order to remove those impediments to women progress. So what I, what I will want is, number one is it's culturally uh, hinged, it's culturally infused. Once those cultural practices are removed, subjugation of women, all these things uh, is what I want. And what I want is for the women to equally stand up and say no and not allow the men to mobilize these cultures, imputing fears in them in order to do what, to continue subjugating them. That's what I will tell the women. Thank you so very, very much, um, Dr. Obiani. It's been an amazing uh, an hour and a half of discussions. Um, and so I would want to, uh, I ask Professor Moray 
and Professor Ogbogbo if they want to come back for maximum two minutes each max to if you have any finishing words, uh, last words before I go back to, to our, our main uh, uh, presenter. Uh, prof let's start with Professor Ogbogbo, then we'll come to Mori. We started with Mori the last time. Professor Ogbogbo, please. Oh, yeah, who can Sorry. hear you now? Yes. Um, again, let me say that it's been uh, a robust discussion. I've read some of the questions. It seems that there is a misconception of some of the things I have raised, not from Ngozika, but some of the um, participants. When I talk about Igbo's bouncing back, I'm therefore not um, after the civil war economically. I'm therefore not advocating that their properties be sequestrated. If, for instance, Biafra goods soon we. All I'm saying is that it cannot be held as a cordial mm -hmm. over Igbos. Each time you hear the discourse about if you go, what happens to your properties, rather than address the issues that they are raising. Those issues are fundamental issues of justice and fair play. And it is not just to the ego, it should spread across to all other groups in Nigeria. Because even the ego need others in Nigeria, needs fairness and justice wherever they are for them to thrive adequately. With regards to um, IPOB, I also want to make this point. Um, often the elite class seem to always dismiss their membership as refrabs, the, the downtrodden. It is not quite true. There are a number of persons, well educated, well positioned, they may not be very visible in coming out because the modus operandi of IPO, for instance, in organizing protest marches and so on. Such persons may not participate, but when you engage them intellectually, you will get to know that they are for read, not because they want the dismemberment of Nigeria, but just because of the magnitude of injustice going on in the Nigerian state. Thank you very much. For Thank you. Time. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Bobo. Uh, Professor More, two minutes. Okay. Well, basically, the issue of decentralization of the federal government, it occurs in every federa fed federation. But the central point was try to have fairness for all. Quotas are all easy to say how unfair they are, but they were designed to ensure an even development. It doesn't work, I would agree, but I think your paper is not looking more carefully at that. The second point would be that if Biafra were to split, the process might not be as nice and peaceful as you might think. May I just remind you that one of the troubles with Igbos in the northern towns is that they tend to have shops. Yoruba tend to have jobs like electricians or taxi drivers. So when a riot takes place, it's the Igbo shops that get looted. Because of course you pay looters by the loot they take. You pay rioters, I mean, by the loot they take. I'd be terrified if we saw in the split up of the country, there wasn't an enormous amount of bloodshed. So I'm very glad that you are very conscious and aware of the bloodshed. But I do admit, I hope Nigeria does stay one and does work out how to overcome tribalism and economic failures of varying sorts. And I hope above all that it survives climate change because when 
say the North gets even hotter than it is now, we may well see real problems of the economy and migration. So in the long run, I think Nigeria faces even more problems than I think you even have thought of for this seminar. Anyway, but thank you very much. I enjoyed it. It took me back to my old student days in 1966 and 67, when we argued about Biafra and Biafran independence. Uh, and of course, my friend Afibo, the late lamented Afibo, was very much in favor of Biafra. He struggled for it. Anyway, thank you. I thank you. It. Thank you very much. It's, it's lovely to go down memory lane. Thank you. <laughs> um, before I ask Ngozi to, to give her last words uh, on this webinar, of course, uh, it might be useful for while we're waiting uh, for now um, to, to begin to appreciate and understand and engage with the participation of the Southeast or the Igbos or the, you know, the agitators, whoever, for participation in the current democratic process that we have. I would, uh, for me, I want, I would like to leave uh, our attendees with something just to, to, rem to think about. Can IPOB or, you know, their group and people who support them, can they form a political party? Can they engage in the political process that we have? Are the Southeastern governors, are they getting their allocations? What do they do with it? Are we asking them to account? What exactly is going on currently for some form of engagement of the citizenry? I'm from Anambra State and a very, very proud Anambra person at that. But the last election, uh, we had maximum, I, I hear less than 15% of the population who are eligible to vote, voted. Uh, again, has IPOB stepped back to understand the impact of, of their, their regime and their hold over the, those Southeastern states on where we are at now? There has to be some form of transition and how, what can we do to get to that El Dorado that we are all desiring. And let me remind us what that El Dorado is. Uh, the words from Professor Bobo, he says that what we want is a united, just, and progressive Nigeria. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Ngozi to, to give us um, her concluding remarks. Two minutes, Ngozi. Thank you, Professor Emilia for being a good host. I thank all the participants. I thank Professor Mure and Professor Obobu. I thank my colleagues from uh, uh, Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability uh, that participated. And then my colleagues from Conflict West Africa Network. I can see some of you here. And then I thank uh, my students that joined my family Everyone, I can see some of them here. And uh, Angelica, you've been so wonderful. You're an angel. You, you've made my stay here very, very, I can't, I can't explain. You are just that big sister, the big sister playing the big sister role uh, here. And then uh, you made me feel welcome and then feel I felt at home actually. And for all the stress I gave you, <laughs> No. I hope you can manage them. <laughs> and then Dr. Vilia, she has been there. She's my sister and everyone. I really appreciate you, Professor Wei. I thank you for sharing this and uh, Professor Emilia for being a good host. I can see my eldest brother here, Michael, Professor Michael Onyebuchi from Netherlands. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Chuku from Ireland. I saw you too. 
And all my cousins, I saw all of you. They all participated too, my students, everyone. And we saw your husband as well. Hey, I did see you. Hey. He said something about his amazing wife. Go. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then I talked to my husband, he is here. He has been so wonderful. And then uh, he has uh, supported my career, manning the home front each time I'm out of the country. He has been so wonderful. Everybody should thank him because it's not easy being raised in a patriarchal system and he's still giving the wife, go ahead, go ahead. So he's the kind of man everybody should emulate. Thank you, thank you, one name, thank you. Oh, you one name, I thank everyone. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> thank you so very much. Uh, I also add my own thanks. Uh, it, uh, the, the Center for African Studies here in SOAS is the wonderful work they do is thank down to Angelica and um, they, she you. gives amazing support and we never say thank you enough. We very much appreciate you, Angelica. Uh, and uh, Professor Mori, you are a Soetian, so that is, we're all together in this. Uh, thank you, Professor Bobo. It would be great for us to, to host you whenever you are in this part of the world. We'll be happy to, to give you some lunch or something to just sort of engage a little bit more with these questions. And we hope that people have enjoyed it. And we hope that we have raised more questions for you to think about. What we were hoping to achieve is for us to begin to set out and concretely engage with some of these issues and see whether is that the right track for us or is there a different track? And Professor um, Ngozeka Obiani has said, that for her, for now, she thinks that a restructured Nigeria might be the way forward. We've given her some feedback. She will take that feedback into account. She will think about it again, and she will write uh, and publish her paper. So thank you very, very much, uh, and have a very lovely evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And if for, for those of you in the US, happy Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and we, we celebrate with you as well. Uh, this you. brings our webinar to an end. Thank you.